Thank you, Lori. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's having a beautiful morning. Um, thanks for coming to share your time with me again. I had a lot of fun um, putting uh, this together uh, to share with you today. And so I hope that you find it relevant. Um, I decided to title it Knowledge is Power um, because as we know, um, knowledge is power and you don't know what you don't know, of course. Um, but I was thinking about knowledge is power with respect to understanding one another and creating really strong, um, meaningful relationships with one another as educators, of course, and then of course with our students and families in our community. And so um, I think that, again, this term culturally responsive is coming up often um, for obvious reasons because it's really important. Um, and I think to build a culturally responsive community, um, we have to really focus on our relationships, right? So building culturally responsive relationships with aut authenticity and humility is what we'll talk a little bit about today. So humility, interestingly enough, the root word for humility is humus, which means earth or grounded in the earth. And so in celebration and recognition of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, um, I thought I would just touch on this concept a little bit, right? So being humble, having humility is really having a modest view of one's own importance, right? And in order to be culturally responsive, um, in order to be compassionate, we have to recognize that there are um, a myriad of diverse life experiences and perspectives through which to see and understand ourselves in the world and others, and of course, um, the world in general. So humility is key to building authentic relationships, right? And it's key to being culturally responsive. Um, and so I also wanted to recognize that today at sundown marks the first day of the holy month of Ramadan, um, which is the ninth month of the Islamic calendar. It's marked by fasting, prayer, reflection, and community. And so um, there are three and a half million Muslims living in the United States. And so I want to recognize that our friends and neighbors and community members are going to be engaging in a month of deep reflection. And I think that we can all gain from that um, understanding as well. And so culturally responsive instruction, uh, I really like this definition. So culturally responsive instruction is a pedagogy that empowers students intellectually, socially, emotionally, and politically by using cultural reference that impart knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Right? So how do we integrate our curriculum right, and our, our communication, our relationships, with materials and information that's relevant to our students' lives. I think we can all relate to this, right? I think especially since um, we've moved to this virtual space of communication and learning and education, we have been inundated with resources, right? We receive resources from individuals every single day. And so if we think about which resources we decide to engage in, or look further into or explore, we can see that we ourselves will only spend the time exploring information that we find to be relevant to ourselves. And so of course it's no different um, in the work that we do with, with students and of course with the community at large. Um, and this word empower will come up later, um, but we have to believe that everyone has the strength within them to learn and to grow, right? And so we have to look at our students through a strengths lens, right? And ourselves as educators through the same lens. We can't look at ourselves through a deficit perspective that we don't have the capacity to relate to our students. We don't have the capacity to relate to individuals 
who perhaps have very different life experiences from us, right? We all have the capacity to grow, but it takes a lot of work. And often it's painful, right? But it's going to be worth it in the end. So this documentary film I came across when I was in grad school several years ago, and it's just something that continues to reemerge for me as being completely relevant to educators, right? And so I'm going to share this trailer with you. Um, it's, it's about two minutes. It's called Precious Knowledge, um, Revolutionary Education, and it follows the ethnic studies ban in Tucson that occurred about 10 years ago exactly, um, and this film came out in 2011. <laughs> pick up a history book and you don't really see any other cultures in there but Caucasian white people. We were like the Mexicans sitting in the back just sitting there because we had to be there. I had a teacher that would tell me like, oh, you're not going to go to college. The way things were going, I probably just would have just left school. I'm not going to lie, I've hated education. <laughs> Everybody knew that the school system was discriminatory. There was an urgency for us to make a statement. We're going to push the envelope a little further. Good morning, you looking for M215? Okay. That's my class. I'm Ms. Kirk West. What's your name? It was really about how can we turn this around? How do we fix societal problems in our school? This class is based on critical thinking. And in that, does come empowerment. I actually know my history now. I started getting A's and B's. Our students are graduating at a much higher rate. Our kids are going to college at a much higher rate. State School Superintendent Tom Horn wants to end ethnic studies programs. I'm calling on Tucson Unified School District to shut down the ethnic studies program. Yeah, yeah. They won't use my tax dollars to promote teaching of hate speech, sedition. The program is administered by vehemently anti-American zealots. No matter how far this bill goes, we're here together in the lucha. We believe it's a matter of life and death. When they try to take these classes away, it's something impossible. God, God, have the idea that race is no longer an issue, what we're saying is BS. You want a different culture, go back to that culture. But this is America. You get away from my border. It's about the freedom to ask the questions that are the most pertinent in the way they view the world. When you have students demonstrating wearing brown shirts, bandanas, this is serious. So this, the documentary film speaks a lot to working with students to better understand their own history and the comprehensive history of the United States and to understand power differentials and to give them the skills and knowledge and attitude, right, to empower them with an understanding that they have the capacity to go out in their lives and navigate these really complex issues. And so I think it's important to know that that film came out in 2011. Today, April 23rd, happens to be the 10 year anniversary of the signing of SB 1070, which is a really important um, law for us to understand as educators and how it impacted our communities of color here in the Southwest. And so the film speaks a lot to this understanding of how, how do we teach our kids? Is it through a lens of manifest destiny, right? That the settlers that came to uh, what is now known as the United States um, were destined to uh, be here, right? And so art, as all of you know, in my opinion, is one of the best ways to really look at and address really complex issues that face our society. So I, in my research um, for this discussion today, I came across this painting, which I think really speaks um, powerfully to this idea of manifest destiny. And historically, uh, this is how uh, we address the history of the United States, right? She's coming through with light, right? She has an a book in her hand. She's going to spread the light, re-educate um, the uncivilized peoples of the Americas. And so when we, when we better understand our comprehensive history, it's... Um, easier for us to then speak to the very complex issues that, that face us uh, in education, right? Or do we 
speak truth to the realities of colonization, right? So when I was in school, which is many, many years ago, of course, and I'm hoping and assuming that the curriculums have changed greatly, um, the colonies, the 13 colonies were a wonderful thing, right? And we never, I don't think I was, it was until I was in college that I really learned about colonization and it wasn't even through the context of the United States. It was in taking courses um, uh, about global issues facing uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, right? And so, you know, I think really better understanding the, the realities of what has happened in our history helps us move forward, right? we can't really know where we're going until we know where we've come from. And I think also, if you remember, one of the students in the documentary says, I know my history now, right? I think that in order to empower our students, they have to have a sense of identity and to know who they are in order to know where they're going, right? So this is an interesting uh, data point. P uh, Pennsylvania State University did a study in 2015 um, that showed that 87% of content taught about Native Americans is through a pre-1900 context, right? Um, 27 states didn't name a single individual Native American in their history standards. And so I was like, wow, that is really fascinating. And so I did a light search and I just Googled, you know, famous Native Americans. And sure enough, a whole list of individuals came up pre-1900, right? And so then I, I, I retyped in famous contemporary Native Americans and I was brought to um, more contemporary information about Native Americans who have made significant contributions um, in our history as a country, and then of course continue to. And we know that in 2018, uh, the first f uh, female Native American to actually um, joined our Congress. And so, um, you know, I think that when we think about our history, it's important to understand that Native Americans didn't stop existing, you know, in 1900, right? There's a whole ongoing history. So if we teach of the, the Trail of Tears, for example, it doesn't stop there, right? What happened after this? So we have to be honest about um, what happens in our communities, especially here in the Southwest, right? So I think that I drove down Indian School Road every day for 10 years on my way to work. I drove past Indian Steel Park, and I never really once considered the fact that there is an Indian school right there in the middle of our city, right? And so, um, you know, it's important for us to weave um, into our curriculum into our conversations uh, with our students every day, the powerful contributions that uh, all of the people of the United States have made in our history, right? Um, so this, this podcast has been shared throughout the district in the last several days, and so I just wanted to speak to it a bit. Um, thank uh, staff at Esperanza for sharing it and then Lori for sharing it with me. And I know many of you have already uh, listened to it or perhaps read the transcript. And if you haven't, I know you plan on doing it and I just strongly recommend that you do. Um, so this is a podcast uh, from Angela Watson, an educator, and this particular episode speaks to um, some of the beliefs that damage teacher relationships with black male students particularly, and then how to connect instead. And so I'm not gonna go into all the details of the podcast, please listen to it, but it, um, it, she's interviewing Principal Kafele, who is a transformational leader in education um, and has worked as a principal in schools throughout New Jersey. And so I just wanted to speak to some of the takeaways about what we can do to empower our students um, and to really start to uh, address this issue of cultural responsiveness. So we need to prepare our students for the realities of the world that we live in, right? So one of um, the beliefs uh, that he speaks to that damages our relationships is this idea that we don't have bias or we don't see color, right? We have to prepare our children for a world that does. Right? We have to introduce students to role models from the community who can provide mentorship and support. Right? So I'm a white woman. Right? I don't know what it's like to be a young black man in South Phoenix, perhaps. Right? 
but I can invite individuals from the community um, from, from a variety of genres that can connect with our students and relate the content that we're sharing with them in ways that are relevant, right? Um, we have to build meaningful relationships by committing to know who your students really are and their history. Um, Michael shared uh, last week, I think, a relationship mapping tool that I'm going to send out after this as well. Um, but we need to really focus on being authentic, right? Being authentic and true to ourselves and being humble when we're engaging relationships with our students and with anyone for that matter. Uh, and so I can't be anyone other than who I am, right? I can't be anything other than a white woman in America, but I can be curious, I can be compassionate, and I can seek to understand a more comprehensive and diverse experience. Um, and then I think that when we're willing to do that, when we're willing to be sensitive um, and honest and open um, and non-judgmental with ourselves, that we're able to extend that into all of our relationships. And we have to have the courage to self-reflect and have conversations about unconscious and implicit bias and all the things that are really sticky and uncomfortable, right? These things are difficult to talk to. They make us uncomfortable. And um, it's important for us to have the courage, right? Because we model to our students what, they, what we want for them to have, the skills and the attitudes, um, and of course the knowledge that we know they need to navigate life. Right, and so in Lori's um, MCRSD Weekly, you know, she speaks a lot to this optimistic mindset, right? And we all are optimists, otherwise we would not be in this field, right? And so how do we support our students to prepare them both academically and socially, right? How do we ensure that they are equipped academic and academically and socially? And so I just wanted to speak a little bit about implicit bias because that comes up a lot in the podcast right and it comes up in a lot a lot in all of our conversations um, because it's really important and we have to remember that our biases are habits we all have them um, and so not acknowledging that we have them is harming us and our relationships and it's doing a disservice to the students and families that we work with right but um, so in uh, an article from Zaretta Hammond uh, that I read recently, um, these were some of the best practices, right? We know that uh, addressing our bias takes intention, it takes attention, and it could take at least a lifetime, right? And that's okay. Um, and so attention is our greatest resource. And so these were some other strategies that she spoke to that I thought were really interesting. So reassociation or stereotype replacement is really reframing negative stereotypes. So when we're willing to be intentional and pay attention to what is going on in our minds and perhaps even in our bodies when we are um, engaging with individuals, um, we can start to interrupt the habitual thought patterns, right? And then reframe them with positive thought patterns. Refuting is a technique where, again, you recognize the stereotype and find examples that prove it wrong, right? Oftentimes, we are activated and we see and understand something immediately a certain way, and we have to be able to step back and take perspective and remind ourselves that this is not true, and I know this because I know it not to be true. Perspective taking, this requires compassion. We cannot take perspective if we're not willing to be compassionate and understand that everybody is coming into this, um, into a conversation, into an interaction through their own lens and life experience. So we have to be compassionate with ourselves and others uh, when we're trying to address these issues around bias. So I remember the day, I don't remember the date, but I remember where I was driving my car to work when I heard this um, on the radio. And so the piece was about, um, again, reframing the way we see and understand people. And in this particular case, young black men. And so again, when I was listening to the podcast with Principal Kafele, um, 
I remembered this and I remember it often because it was very powerful. And so I'm going to share this with you. This is um, a public service announcement from the NAACP. I am a statistic. I am the one out of three who will go to college. I am the three out of four who don't do drugs. I am the five out of nine who have a job. I am the seven out of eight who is not a teenage father. I am the 11 out of 12 who won't drop out of high school. I have a purpose and that's a fact I'm proud of. So building culturally responsive relationships and weaving culturally responsive lessons into our curriculum starts with a foundational belief that we all have value, we all have purpose, and we all have strengths, right? And so our role in education is to uncover those strengths and help our young people know their value and their worth and to give them the tools to um, feel empowered to go out into the world and pursue their goals and dreams. Um, and so that's all I have for you today. I wanted to share this with you. I have gone against all of the basic 101 of community organizing rules and decided to uh, host without your advice or um, permission or um, request a perspective film series. So on the last Tuesday of the month, with, which happens to be next Tuesday, April 28th, um, I'm gonna send out a Zoom link for us to meet if you're interested to view the documentary film Pres Precious Knowledge. This has been a really powerful tool for me um, and I want to share it with all of you who are interested. So uh, look forward to that link. And also I have included today the list of resources that I explored to put together um, today's discussion. And so I hope that you found this time valuable. I hope you found it relevant to your days. Um, and I think you all have a wonderful day. Thank you, Lori. Um, there was just a little bit of uh, a few comments in the, in the chat that I, I thought, um, are, are particularly relevant and um, they were about they were around safety and creating a safe environment for people to um, really um, you know uh, be self-reflective and to and, and to go down that path and and how we create that self environment and um, Tamila even commented that people will test those waters to see how safe they are. And so I think that concept of safety is really important. I don't know if you wanna address it right this second or if it may be something that we follow up with later. I thought it was very interesting. I think that I'll address it briefly and then we can follow up with it. You know, I think we have to be committed to one another to create a space of safety around these things. And we have to be committed to creating environments where we're not scared to ask questions that we feel are stupid you know, or that are going to offend somebody. And I think that um, it'll be interesting as we move forward in Esperanza reading crucial conversations, how this comes up, right? Because these are all crucial conversations um, around culturally responsive uh, learning, around building culturally responsive relationships. Um, and so we are responsible for creating safety in uh, in the environments that we work in and i think almost a silver lining of this virtual time is that there is a slight buffer right so this is a great time for us to really start to 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 be honest and open and non-judgmental and non-critical and mostly compassionate and humble right so um again knowing that our lens is simply our lens our truth is simply our truth and we have to be willing to step back and acknowledge that other people are allowed and have permission to have their own truth but i think this concept of safety is extremely important and i can um, perhaps uh, address it 
more in the in the coming um, Thursday morning uh, live with Lori. You know? yeah. All right, great. I'm just going to leave us with um, the comment that Larry Ross put in the chat. He said, studies show that students of color flourish academically and socially when they're taught in a culturally competent settings. Ties into the African proverb, know thyself. I just thought that's what we're doing. That's why we're doing this. And Larry, I, I appreciate you putting that in the chat. And with that, we're going to wrap up today's um, learning break and got a lot of work today to get to. So um, I wish you all a great, happy, safe Thursday. Thank you. Thank you.